Psalm 67. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You all have it? Say, Amen. If you don't have it, say, Oh no. Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2. And it reads there, I'm going to read out of the uh, New International Version. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your waves may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Father, we thank you. We love you and we adore you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. God, and I come here today asking that you would bless us. Bless your people. That we would understand your word and that we would use it timely in wisdom. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would walk up and down the aisle. That you would comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That we would move and do what you call us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Now I'm sitting here asking God for confirmation because my title is Bless Me, Lord. And so I was in there and the first song I hear is the worship team singing a song about blessings and God's favor. So, you know, God, God often speaks when we're listening. So, he, so God speaks. Come on, tell your neighbor, God speaks. Yes, he does. And I pray you listen this morning. Because if we're going to build a, a ministry for our future, a ministry that I believe will affect tens of thousands, then it, we need people to be blessed. God bless one. Let me say it again. If we're going to build a great ministry, we need people to be blessed. Amen. See, every person in church today has a desire to be blessed. You don't go up to a person, hey, I bet you don't want to be blessed. The person will slap you. What are you talking about? I want to be. Everybody wants to be blessed, right? And I find that without exception. But you know, I find some people failed to pray for a blessing. To literally pray for a blessing. And, and, and I, there's a lot of reasons. We'll talk about that. But I want you to think how good it felt when God blessed you. Do you remember that time? I, I think everybody, uh, sometime or another, God blessed you. You can go, man, that felt great. Didn't it? Right? And the Bible is clear. And I believe God wants to bless you. Amen. He wants to bless you. It's God's desire to bless I often say that, that God is in the blessing business. You know, some people may, may sell trinkets. Some people may be a supervisor. Some people, whatever you may do. And that's your business. That's great. But God's business is to bless. So, and one reason God hates sin. And we talked about sin last week. But I believe one of the greatest reasons why God hates sin, and he hates it so much, because it robs God of his ability to bless you. Because he can't bless a mess. Hello? He can't bless sin. He can't, he can't stamp, oh, sin, you're, you're still sinning. It's okay, I'm going to bless you. No, he's got to deal with the sin. That's why he hates it so much. See, God, God's blessings are a direct result of our relationship with him. If we're walking with him, we're talking with him, right? And last week, we began 2018 with repentive prayer. Because if our relationship is not right, there's nothing I can say, preach, or promise that will bless you. If, if, right now, if, if, if you're deep in sin, I can say everything. I can lay my hands on you. I can have Benny, Benny Hinn come and spit in your face. It's not going to bless you if you're walking around in sin, if you're shucking and jiving and conniving. Well, so, we, so last week, prayerfully, we dealt with that, right? We said we're going we're gonna to repent and we want to pray. 
Why? Because once you have repentance and you begin to pray, now you're developing a relationship, the right relationship with God. You're not just coming to church and acting like a Christian. You are a Christian, right? And you have that relationship. Now you get in God's way. No, he can see you now. Because we found last week that if you're in sin, he can't even hear you. He doesn't, he, he doesn't even want to look upon you. Right? The prayer, the prayer of a righteous, the righteous people gets much accomplished. So it begins with getting right. Now, don't confuse getting right with being perfect. Right? Uh, what, what, what does my, my, our door hanger say? The men's home ha- ha- put out some door hangers yesterday, right? And it says, no perfect people allowed. Right? So if you're perfect, you're excused. You can leave right now. <laughs> but for the rest of us that are all messed up, you can stay. Amen? So there's no perfect people allowed. So righteous does not mean perfect. If, if that was the case, then we're all messed up and we're never going to be right, uh, perfect. So we might as well just go home and get high. Right? No, no. Righteous means this. That you're in right standing with God. That you recognize who you are, a sinner, hello somebody, and you recognize that you're in need of a Savior, and without Jesus Christ as your Savior, you got nothing coming. Oh, I, I, let me take it back. You get one thing coming. You deserve hell. That's all we deserve. But see, once you're in right standing, you're saying, God, I need your help because I don't want to, I want to make it with you. Now God's okay, now you got something here. Come here. Now you're in blessings way. And that's what I'm talking about, being in blessings way. See, people have come under I, I, like five or six, or maybe five main areas where they, they, they talk themselves out of or maybe they hold back God's blessing in their life. Some people feel they're trapped by life circumstances. In other words, they've had a, a bad past. Anybody have a bad past, don't raise your hand. We've had, and then what happens, you allow your past to trap you. Let me let you in on something. You can't change the past. Right? If, if you're not careful, you allow your past to disrupt your present and to curse your future. And God does not want that for you. Huh? But we get trapped in that area. Other people are just afraid. Some people, you know, some people are afraid to ask God to bless them. Because they think, well, that's too good to be true. I, I don't get blessed. Uh, Sister Solomon will always get blessed, but me, not me, because... You know, and, and if I ask him and he don't give me, then I might be a failure. So they're afraid. Others are just feel they're unworthy. They're unworthy. They feel like they're not worthy of God's blessing. Let me let you in on something. You're all unworthy. Can I say it again? You're, you don't feel like you're unworthy. You are. But it's not an issue whether you're worthy. If that were the case, we got nothing coming. The best we can do is like filthy rags. The best we can do is like filthy rags of the Lord. So, so you can't say, well, I'm unworthy to get past that. That feeling that you're unworthy of God's blessing. God doesn't look on how you feel about yourself. God looks on how he feels about you. Huh? But they get trapped by that. Some think they're unlovable. How can God love me? Look what I've done. Look, I, look, 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 look. Huh? And again, that's that emotion. And it leaves, and some of you are skeptical. You know, the, the, the kind is always, everything's negative. Those are the kind of people, skeptical people. Those are the kind of people that would, like I've said sure many times, that would, get, that would win the lotto of a million dollars and complain of the taxes. So, you know what I mean? Brother, you had nothing, now you're complaining about the taxes? Better go cash your check and tithe. Hello, someone. Say, today I, I believe that you're going to be set free. Because God wants to bless you. God, and I want God's blessing to fall upon your life. Upon us all. Blessings. Does anybody want to be blessed? See, let me tell you something. A lot of time God wants to bless you and, and you're so preoccupied you don't hear him. You don't pay attention. And, and you know, people say, how, how do you do it? You know, I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm no different than anybody. But as life passes me by, I see opportunities that come by me, right? And I'm listening, I'm paying attention. I'm always thinking about the spiritual thing, right? And I know when to pull the trigger. Pow! Oh, I got it. I pull the trigger and a blessing happened. Because I was paying attention. 
The other story, true story, the guy back in the, what was the early, early part of the century where they had the telegraph. You guys know what a telegraph is? Some of you don't know the telegraph. Back in, they didn't have, you know, Bluetooth, uh, uh, those sm- dumb phones, right? They, could, they couldn't dial. Hey, I was, I was, uh, we had a, I have a, a, my, my other house, I still have it, I have a phone, an old phone. You guys know the dialing phone where you put your finger in, right, the old phone? Well, my son wanted to use the phone, and I go, well, use the phone on the wall. It works. It was actually like a decoration, but it worked. So he, he's standing there looking at it. <laughs> he's looking at the phone. He goes, how do you work that? I go, and I go, I go how do you work it? I go, and I go, wow, I'm getting old. Because, you know, you've got to put your finger on the, the number, and you go, and it goes, right? Right? Technology. Well, this is before that. Well, these have telegraph. And they're on the wire, and they go, beep, 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 beep. And they would send messages, dot, 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 right? True story. The guy comes in for, for a job interview, and there's about this many people in there, and they're all waiting, and they're fighting for one job. So he sits down, and he's kicking back. And, I'll, and they, these people have been waiting for, oh, God, an hour at least. And he walks in, and just sits down. All of a sudden, he... And he gets up and he walks to the door, comes out and he tells everybody, everybody, you go, come and leave now. Uh, I just got hired. And they were mad. I've been here an hour. I've been here half an hour. I've been here two hours. And they're mad. And the boss came in. And what had happened, the boss explained to him, well, for the past two hours, I, I was typing, beep, 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 beep. If you can understand what I'm saying, come in and you got the job. And the only one that listened was the last guy who came in. He heard. No one else was paying attention. See, and that's how God speaks to people. The only ones that hear are the ones that are listening. Most people are so caught up in other things. Now listen, some other things are important, but they're not too important not to pay attention to what God is saying to you. Your career, great, but your career won't get you to heaven. Your activities, wonderful, but those things will not get you to heaven. Nothing in front of God's relationship will get you to heaven. But most people pay attention to those things instead of the Morse code of their heart. See, God's blessing, you talked about earlier, and it really it's God's favor on us. God's favor. That word favor is an act of kindness beyond what is due or usual. Unfair partiality. You ever heard, seen that? Or, or preferential treatment. You know, in a family, if you have a large family, there's always a favorite. And all the brothers and sisters hate it. Oh, he's your favorite. Or she's your favorite. You ever, come on now. Yeah, if you're, if, you know, my, my, my wife had like 12 kids. And undoubtedly with her dad, she's the favorite. I know. I see. <laughs> Spoiled brat. Nah, just kidding. But she gets preferential. She is, you know, right? In my family, I had nothing coming. Nothing. My, the favorite in my family was my brother Rick. He was my mom's favorite. My, I mean, the favorite. Favorite, favorite, favorite. Right? And you always kind of get mad. See, that's favor. And the thing about favor is my brother never did nothing to, special to gain it. He just got it. Right? And, and when you get favor, it, it, it doesn't require any effort from you. And God has an ability, and he wants to give favor. He wants to give Unfair partiality to people. God's favor. And let me tell you something about God's favor. God's favor is not fair. See, because sometimes, and really, you'll, you'll see, I go, man, how come this sister, she's always getting blessed? Well, she got God's favor. Well, how come I ain't got blessed? Because you ain't got it. <laughs> Maybe she asked for more, I don't know, but you, she got it. You ain't got it, brother. He got it. You, you're out. And don't get all mad. You just got to stay true. Because God wants to give favor, but it's up to him. It's not fair. It's God. See, God's favor comes in many forms. And really, when his favor comes, it comes in the form of a supernatural gifting. We don't earn them. In fact, no person can give us God's blessing. Proverbs 10, 30, 22 reads, The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich and he adds no sorrow to it. Now, that's very interesting. 
It says the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich. What? He doesn't say the blessings of the Lord are riches. See, that's what people say. Well, I want to be blessed. No, no. God doesn't give money. He gives blessings. And those blessings get you rich. Make you is an operative word. It's, a, it's, a, it's an adjective. It's a ver verb rather than it's making. Makes you rich. So the blessings, you take them, makes you rich. What well, could be a spiritual blessing? You got wisdom. You got understanding. You got knowledge. You have the ability. These blessings will help you. Some people, this is what they do. Instead of asking for the, the blessings, the spirit, supernatural blessings, they are asking for the money. And that, that God doesn't operate that way. Well, he's not, a, he's not Bank of America. His favor, his blessings makes one rich. Do you see the difference? See when, and Why? Because when God gives it, there's no sorrow attached to the blessing. When you seek out riches solely for the poor, the, the sake of riches, then you're, mis, you're, you're misrepresenting God, especially if you're a Christian, and you're looking for the wrong thing. And listen, when you get those things, you'll know it's not God. Why? Because that money, anything you get, will make you miserable. Of most men, you will be miserable. But when God gives, there's no sorrow. Why? Because God is not, not concerned with making a Donald Trump, although he has no, he's not offended by him. No, God will meet your need. Will meet your need. Do you know, I'm going to tell you something. If some of you became millionaires, you'd backslide, fornicate, and become a pervert. Well, that's why you're not, you ain't got no, no, no cashola, because you couldn't handle it, dude. He, God might as well say, hey, here's the money, go to hell. Because God loves you so much, you couldn't handle it. He ain't going to do it. He has to give you his blessings, see how you operate with his supernatural gifts, and maybe his favor will come your way. But so the American culture, the people, we just, we just give me the money. God don't work that way. God will meet your need. And then as you're faithful over what? Little. He'll put you over much. And most people don't even want to be faithful over little. They have a little. They want, give me a lot. I'll do more, God. You'll, if he gives you a lot and you're not faithful or little, you'll do more. You'll do more damage. Hello, someone. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. See, the devil is always trying to counterfeit the blessings of God. And our selfish nature makes us very susceptible to the deception of a counterfeit blessing. Because some people say, oh, God, God bless me. He did? Yeah, man. I got this extra paying job and I got all that stuff. Oh, okay. Now, as a spiritual man, I said, how is that person going to handle that blessing? Now, if that blessing takes you from your relationship with God, listen, my friend, God didn't give that to you. The devil gave that to you. You think God would give you blessings so that you'd leave him? God would give you blessings so you stop coming to church? No, oh, that's a counterfeit. That's a counterfeit, my friend. I've been do I'm good at counterfeiting. I know, how, I know what a counterfeit looks like. You know why I know what a counterfeit looks like? See, the FBI, they have people that are trained to handle counterfeit money. And, and it's, unlike us, they're, they're a little smarter than us. A person trained on handling a counterfeit never looks at a counterfeit. People say, well, they have to study counterfeit. No, 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 no. What a counterfeit expert only does is put his hands on the real deal. He never touches a counterfeit. Why? Because when he touches it, he'll know something's wrong. I, I've, I've touched bills all my life. I, I've studied the real deal all my life, and this is not real. How do you know? Because I know. All I do is look at the real deal. See, and that's what we have to do. We have to continue to look at the real deal to understand what's a counterfeit. Unfortunately, most people, when we live in this world, we get so polluted by counterfeit, we bring it to church and try to make it the real deal. Mm -mm. Keep your eye on the real deal. Don't settle for a counterfeit. Uh, Proverbs eleven sixteen reads like this. A kind-hearted woman gained respect, but ruthless men gain only wealth. Counterfeit, they change shape. It starts off holy. It might even look holy. 
right? But if it's a counterfeit, it'll, it'll change shape, right? It's like that Star Trek or Star, yeah, Star Trek uh, program where you had a, a shapeshifter. Or no, no, what's the one? The, the X-Men. You know, the one who you touch them and they, that has all these different forms, shapeshift, become what it wants. And that's what a counterfeit blessing does. It'll start off looking holy, but if it ain't God, it'll shift on you. It'll pull you from your calling. It'll pull you from faithfulness. It'll pull you from righteousness. But it's, it, it felt good in the beginning. It said hallelujah. It said praise the Lord. So that thing, what happens when it changes shift, it changes shape rather, that thing that brought you so much pleasure will now usher in pain. Remember, God, God's blessing never brings sorrow. So you'll, over time, now up front, that's why he had a lot of conflict. The pastor said, hey, bro, you be careful. Sister, you shouldn't do that. And people get mad at me because this is God, this is God, this is God. Okay, I'll just tell you what I think. You're going to do your own thing, but time will tell. As a pastor, I sit back, and I've been doing this 33 years. I've seen people say, this is God, only for it to shift a couple years later, and the pain begin to rise. It wasn't God. It wasn't God in the beginning, and it isn't God now. Because God's blessing never changed shape. Never Amen? Yeah. See, the blessing that God brings are always a blessing. Let me say that again. The, guessing that, the blessing that God brings is always a blessing. And I want to always be best, blessed. Two types of blessing. First, you have conditional. Well, let me, let me back up. First, you have unconditional blessing. This is, this is where it's like, wow, that's heavy. You receive according to the loving kindness of God. You could call this compassionate blessing. And God just gives it because he wants to. Maybe he was bored that day and he's seen you. Oh, bless him. I don't know. But he'll come. And it'll come in the form of, of material wealth, emotional stability, spiritual insight can be given to whomever God chooses based solely on his desire. On him. You have nothing to do with it. You know, why does this person understand? Why, why, why? Because God just decided, I'm going to give it to this one. All right? That's his choice. But we know this. Romans 8, 28 reads like this. And we know this, that all things work, all things God works for good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, there's a key right there, Romans 8, 28. When God begins to give stuff, and he will, he's not doing it because of you. He's really doing it despite you. He's doing it because he sees something in your heart that says, I am going to do his will and his purpose. He spotted it. And when he spots it, and it's very easy for him to spot because most people don't want to do that. So when he spots it, he goes, that's the one. What? That one, that person has decided in their heart to do my will and my purpose. They may not know much now. They may not understand what, what, even what I'm saying right now. But in their heart, they've decided, I'm going to serve God, and that's it. And I'm going to do whatever i got to do. Boom, God begins to pour out in that person. And all of a sudden, those people have been around a while, you know, sophisticated Christian. They've been in church for a while. You know how to say hallelujah, praise the Lord. How you feel? Blessed and highly, highly sanctified. Right? And they see, well, well how come that brother or that sister just been here? Well, how come they're getting all this stuff? Why? Because God sees the heart. You look good on the outside, but on the inside. Mm. Oh, you need some life salt. It's dirty in there. Right? Unconditional. God just does it. Now, there are other types of blessings that are conditional. You will get according to what you produce and what you do. Sometimes you got to do something. Just because you were born doesn't mean you get blessed. Right? Just because my children were born and I was a pastor and we've been serving the God doesn't mean my children will automatically get blessed. They will have some blessings, but they're going to have to get on their giddy. In other words, we're all responsible for doing something. You don't get just by being. You have to do something. Hmm? Something. Get blessed. I got a joke. It has nothing to do with the message, I think. But it's kind of funny. I heard it the other day. There's a story about a guy who, who said to his friend, Hey, man, I'm sorry to hear that your, your wife ran off with the gardener. The friend says, that's all right. I was going to fire him anyway. <laughs> oh, let me get back here. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 reads like this. 
For even when you were, we were with you, it's Paul speaking of the church, we gave this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Wow. That means you got to work. Got to do something. That's the bottom line. You got to do something. You got to work. Well, I, I want to be blessed. Go, go, go get a job. Maybe, just maybe you will get blessed if you start working. It's an amazing thing you do when you go to work. All of a sudden you get a check in your name. You go, how'd that happen? You worked. Huh? Proverbs 15, 19 reads, The way of the sluggard is blocked with thorns, but the path of the upright is a highway. Ooh, highway to heaven. Huh? Right? Because the sluggard, the lazy one, always got an excuse. Oh, I want to, but this got in my way. And I want to, but, I, but this. And I want to, and I, and I want to. And I, you got all these things. Because it says the way of a lazy person always has thorns. Thorns are troubles and, and tribulations. You know, some people, you know, the, the, their middle name is, is trouble. Tribulation. Right? But the way of the upright is a highway. No obstacles. You been on the highway? Boom. You ever been in Europe going to Autobahn? That's a bad place, man. You're going to the Autobahn. I, was, I thought it was bad. I was driving a, a BMW, a little small one. Wham! I'm going about 100 miles an hour because you can go as fast as you want. It's a trip. Your insurance rate your, goes down as you go faster, but you can still travel as fast as you want. And I'm jamming. Wham! I thought I'm going bad. Yeah, da, 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 da. this is pretty cool, right? And all of a sudden, I see a little speck in my rear view mirror, and they flash. Boom. I look up, I go, what the heck is that? Right? And then I, by the time I looked again, that Maserati flew by me like I was on a movie. Wham! It was so bad. Boom, 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 boom. That, he had to be going 180. I'm, this guy was flying. But see, that's how we are when we're upright. When we're upright, we're not faking it. We're really trying to do the thing of God. We're on an autobahn. We're jamming towards his blessings. The only reason why you're not getting to your blessing is because there's too many thorns in the way. There's no reason why we all shouldn't be on, 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 on the blessing highway other than ourselves. Hello? Conditional, material wealth, emotional stability, and spiritual insight will often have conditions on them. You don't just got to come in. Now, again, there are some people who are God's favor. They just get it. I don't know. Favor isn't fair. But that's not, that's not for the most of us. For the most of us, we got to do something. Hello? We have to get on our giddy up. We have to get going. So if we desire emotional strength, then Paul instructs us that we must think on things of good report. Right? See, we go, God bless me with emotional strength. Well, then stop your stinking thinking. I, I'm amazed, you know, you know, women tend to be very emotional and they, they get really emotional drowned. And they spend all day watching soap operas. Hello. Doesn't your life have enough problems? You don't have to watch TV and watch more problems? And then you wonder why you don't have emotional strength. Stop it. Begin to think on good things, of good report. It's conditional. Your emotional well-being is conditional on what you listen to, who you talk to, who you hang around with. Listen, if you hang around with a turkey, you're going to gobble. I don't know. I, I feel like a turkey. Well, who you hang around with? Mr. Turkey and Mrs. Turkey. All right? If we desire spiritual insight, then as Jesus teaches, we must pick up our cross and follow him. You want spiritual insight? It doesn't happen by studying the word. No, that, that's part of it. No, what happens when you want spiritual insight means you've got to pick up your cross and follow him. Not just go to Bible college. Bible college has messed up more people than I can count. But when you pick up your cross, what does that mean? That you die to your flesh. That you die to yourself. That you die. That you commit spiritual homicide on yourself. Then you can get some spiritual insight. You want spiritual insight, what, just by coming to Vetti? You ain't going to get that by going to Vetti. You'll get a certificate. But you need to die. You want spiritual insight. I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. He didn't say, I went to Bible college and got a bachelor's. Well, that's cool. That's fine, but that's not where you get spiritual insight. You've got to crucify yourself. Jesus says, pick up your cross 
and follow me. If you desire wealth, that's cool. And I want this. But oftentimes, we underbid ourselves. Oh, you, you're asking for things that really, are you kidding me? Is that it? You know, and th- those things like, oh, I want a house, I want a car. Those are fine, and God may even provide, but that's it? I, 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 I've, I've, I've sort of graduated from that. I'm thinking, God, I want to take a country Amen. for your honor and glory. I want to conquer, conquer a people for your honor and glory. I don't want to just, just a, a house. That's boring. Really, I want a continent. Oh, you can look at me like I'm crazy. I'm telling you, I'm not crazy. I want a continent for God's honor and glory. I want a country. I want to put my name on it, and I want to say, you know what? Victory Arch, Colorado Springs, we went into this country, and we took it over. That's what I want to do. Why? Because God says I could. God says, wherever I plant my feet, dun, 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 that song, right? That you guys sang, wherever I put my feet. God will give it to me. Why? Because I got God's favor. I got supernatural, invincible, unstoppable favor in my life. Dun, 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 dun. I got supernatural, invincible, unstoppable favor in my life. Oh, I want to shout about it. Yeah. See, some of you just think you're coming to church. I don't want you to come to church. You got to understand that when you're walking with God, you have supernatural, huh, invincible, unstoppable favor in your life. It's just not about getting clean or getting a, uh, having a husband or a wife. If that's all you want, man, what kind of God do you serve? That's not why God came here so that you can have a wife. God came here so you can have a husband, a house. You think that's why God came here? Are you kidding me? God came here because he wants us to conquer the world for his honor and for his glory. That's why he's here. All that other stuff that I just mentioned are just afterthoughts. Oh, you'll get that. You got that coming because that's not our goal. Our goal is way beyond that. Huh? Why? Because, we, no, I have seen. And even the thing is that if no, I have seen or no, no, or no ear has heard or hasn't even entered the, the mind, then what I'm thinking is not enough. God has even more than that. Because I could, I could think of a lot of good stuff. Huh? More than that. Huh? There's three, and we talked about three areas of blessing. First, you have the material wealth or, or the material blessing. The, I call that the ability to make wealth. You know, some people have just have the ability to make wealth. While others have the ability to spend wealth. <laughs> some people have the ability to make wealth. Huh? You know, houses, furniture, vehicle, anything physical or tangible, that's, you know, I call wealth. Huh? My body, it's part of the material world. And some people are blessed with the material. Genesis 26, 12 reads like this. Isaac planted crops in the land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord had blessed him. That's cool. Isaac planted, and God gave him a hundredfold. Why? Not because of anything he did, because the Lord blessed him. Right? And so that, that principle still holds true. You can do that. We pray, be blessed 30, 60 and a hundredfold, right? That's the material wealth. Verse 13, the man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. See, now listen, I've said this many times, one does not need God to produce wealth. You can do it without God. But see, if you want wealth where there's no sorrow to it, then you have to begin to put God in his proper perspective. If all you want is wealth, go get a job, get a hustle, make some deals, and you can get wealthy. If that's what you want. But that's not God's doing, that's your doing. Now, we want God's blessing on it. Amen? We need God, here's the key, we need God to ensure our wealth remains a blessing and not a curse. That's why we need God. Because we can go out there, and and what's Jose's favorite scripture? Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob from God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Verse 9, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. 
That's what happens. When we begin, we get all these blessings, these blessings, these blessings. We fail to put God first, then we become thieves. Oh, I, how am I doing it? It's very clear. See, but if we want to remain under God's blessing, then you've got to operate the way God instructs us to operate. Not, not man's ways, God's ways. If you want material wealth. Another way God blesses you is emotional. Having a sound mind. Now, if you never won 5150, then you don't know what I'm talking about. You guys, you guys don't know what 5150 is? If, they, if the psychiatrist has determined that you are crazy, you're criminally insane, you are called 5150. Right? Now, if that's not you, praise the Lord. But God says that you are to have a sound mind. He wants to bless you with a sound mind. Acts 24, 16 reads like this. I always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and everyone else. See, a clear conscience. You ever have a guilty conscience? And when people have a guilty conscience, they just, there's nothing right. They just feel they're guilty. You know those kind of people when, when they know they're talking about you, they're lying about you, and they can't look you in the eye? You know what I'm talking about? They all, they all, hey, hi, pastor. They're all, hi, pastor. <laughs> huh? Guilty conscience. And see, we, God says, you don't have to walk around with a guilty conscience. You should have a clear conscience. Paul says that he always maintains a clear God before, a clear conscience before God, but, and also, everyone else. You can't have a clear conscience before God if, you're not a, if you do not have a clear conscience before people. If you have convinced yourself of that, you are really in darkness. Because your relationship with, with God is contingent, is prioritized on your relationship with others. Well, you have to have right relationship with others. Mm. See, Paul, attacked by people who didn't like him, was able to withstand these assaults because he was emotionally blessed. He didn't let the, the attack from people affect him. See, if people could talk about you, right? and it affects you, then you're emotionally unstable. Let me say it again. If people can talk about you, and it affects you, you are emotionally unstable. Like, because when you're walking with, right with God, people can say anything, and you don't matter, because you're focused on God. If you allow others to affect you, then you're, you have not, you missed something. So you need to begin to ask God to bless you emotionally. Because in this world, you will suffer persecution. You, Jesus said, you shall. Not, oh, it's possible. Maybe if you do the wrong thing, you'll, no, no, no. In this world, if you walk according to his statutes, if you walk in his ways, you will suffer persecution. Then he says, but be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world. How can he say that? Because Jesus was emotionally stable. Huh? And if you're not emotionally stable, you, you'll get hurt. Oh, they talk about me. Okay, you'll start sucking your thumb in the spirit. Oh. Why? Because you're, you're still emotionally unfit. Hmm. Right, we, we need emotionally blessed people. We do. How are we going to take the world if all the devil's got to do is talk about you? We're going to take the world for Jesus. Oh, that brother, let's talk about him. Oh, your mama. Your mama wears county boots. Huh, your children are ugly your, and your dog stinks. <laughs> We're not going to be able to take a block with people like that. We have to be emotionally stable because people will talk about you. Don't let them bother you. Don't let them get under your skin. Focus on the things of God. Move forward. Be blessed. Stay blessed. Don't let somebody rob you. Well. Huh? See, the blessing of not holding grudges or spite is very hard to measure, but it is always evident. Because some people say, oh, not me, Pastor, not me. Yeah, okay, when we watch you and you hold spite. In other words, somebody talked about you. Let's say somebody just talked about you. And you got hurt, but you fought it off, right? And then you see that person. And they get theirs. You know, oh, God, deal with them. Maybe God dealt with them. If you feel good about it, something's wrong with you. Because you shouldn't feel good about it. We're talking about eternity in hell. 
We're talking about suffering. It says the right heart is compassion even to those who dislike them. The right heart prays even for those who have cursed them. The right heart. But when you have a wrong heart, oh, you, oh, good, that's what they get. See, that's what happens when they mess with the child of God. That's what they get. No, 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 my friend. That's a wrong attitude. That's not emotionally stable. That's very unstable. Why? Because I want people that are materially blessed and emotionally blessed. Why? Because we want to get to the real important things. You're spiritually blessed. How could you be deal with the spiritual realm if you're still holding grudges or, or, you're, or you're glad at somebody else's failure or, or whatever the case may be? Because God wants to bless you. Let me say it again. God wants to bless you. But you have to be able to handle the blessing. Spiritual blessing, I'm going to end with this, coming from land, is best described in the book of Ephesians. My favorite book. Really, my favorite book in the New Testament is the book of Ephesians. Well, I call the book of Ephesians the genesis of the New Testament. Ephesians 1, 3 reads like this. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Blessed us in the heavenly realm. Spiritual blessings always begin in the heavenly realm. And they're measured not in terms of what we see here, but they're measured in terms of eternity. When God looks at a spiritual blessing, he'll give it to you. Why? Because it has eternal consequences Eternal consequences. And if we want to boil that down, the only thing that has eternal consequences are souls. Nothing here is of, is, is, has any value in compared to a person's soul. Hmm? The blessings benefit eternity and is not measured in financial terms. That's why although we want material blessings, we don't measure our spirituality based on our material blessings. Because material blessings, look, they don't get to heaven. You know how I know? Because the pharaohs tried that. The pharaohs buried everything in the pyramids. Huh? And before, within a hundred years, everything in those pyramids was stolen. Hmm? Gone. Spiritual blessings are recognized by spiritual people and credited to the works of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1.9 reads, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself. Spiritual blessings are always in line with the active will of God. When you're spiritually blessed, you are doing things for God. You're not just, just sitting home and, and living large, living the life, taking a vacation every year. No, no, you don't even have a vacation. Your vacation is doing something for God. Why? Because you understand my spiritual blessings, what God has given me is just for his will, not for your satisfaction, Although you may gain satisfaction, that's not why he gives it to you. Oh, I want, I want Martin to be satisfied, so let me just bless him. No, 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 no. He says, Martin is doing my will. He's doing something for me. Let me give him more. That's how you get it. Right? Spiritual blessings are evidenced by the sacrifice given by each person. No sacrifice? You're not picking up your cross if you're not sacrificing. No, you're more concerned with other things. Oh, yeah, we, we, and they sound good too. Oh, you know, I got to take care of myself. I got to take care of my family. Oh, those sound good. But listen, if you're taking care of your family and you're not taking care of God, you're not taking care of your family. You're not. You have to put God first. You put God first and begin to focus on Him. You watch your family prosper. Because why? Because God will begin to give you spiritual blessings. But so we don't want that. We don't want, I want the blessing over here first, and then I'm going to help you out, God. You know, I got to get my kids in line and my wife in line. You know, I got to control them. Hello, someone. Spiritual blessings are evident by the sacrifice given by each person. Right? Now, you know, we're not, today we're not required to make animal sacrifices. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, I'd have my dog, Bentley. <laughs> Poor Bentley, he'd be gone. No, we're not. But we are required to make sacrifices, right? Our sacrifice is in relation to the spiritual blessing given to each person. Romans 12, 1, very clear. Paul, we're right to the Roman church, he says, Present your body a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Present your living, look to your neighbors as you talk about your body. You have to present that body, that body, your body as a living sacrifice. 
A person's spirituality is based on their personal sacrifice. When I look at my leaders, when I look at Pastor Sonny, when I look at Nikki, I know their personal sacrifice. And because of their personal sacrifice, look what they've done. And so my, my model, I go, I want to sacrifice like them, like Pastor Steve, like them. Why? Because that's the model I'm following. Paul says to his disciples, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ sacrificed it all. Put himself on the cross. He died. And Jesus is not asking you to die, but there has to be some sort of sacrifice. Is it going to be hard at times? Of course it's going to be hard if, at times. Why? Because sacrifice means sacrifice. Is it going to be easy? No. But God will give you the grace and the ability to do it. And I have found this. When I am sacrificing and I'm in God's will, it's okay. It doesn't bother me that much. I'm cool with it. In fact, and then all of a sudden I go through my sacrifice and God begins to bless. I go, well, that's heavy, God. It hurt a little bit, but now I understand something. Why? Because I'm getting spiritual. Now, to the unspiritual, you're getting mad at me right now. You, walk, you want to walk out? I'm sorry. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to get you in the blessings way. I'm telling you. I'm trying to get you in the blessings way. Because God wants to bless you. Huh? Look at your neighbor. Say, God wants to bless me. Spiritual blessings give wisdom and revelations to them that have them. Huh? Blessings. I watched the thing about Ricky um, Henderson. You guys know Ricky Henderson? That guy was cool. Baseball player. He was from Oakland. Oak Town. But he had this swag about him. He did. He, and when, even when he batted, he had a swag. And it, you know, the thing about Ricky Henderson, you know, he wasn't arrogant. But people look at him, oh, that guy's arrogant. That's just the way he was. He, he didn't know how not to walk with swag because he was swag. And he wasn't, trying to, he wasn't trying to hurt nobody. That just was his personality, right? He was, he was blessed. He was blessed with gift. He could run. And he did. He would, he would hit. And when he hit a horn, he'd, he'd take off, and he would pop his collar. And it's not because he was trying to make somebody get angry. He, he's like, I'm just a blessed dude, right? And he was. That was his personality. Well, that's how we had to be. We had to walk with the kind of swag. That God is blessing us, and we can't help it. Don't get mad at me. You know how you say, don't hate the player, hate the game. I'm just, in it. I'm just being blessed, man. I'm walking with some spiritual swag. Every now and then when God bless you, go like this, pop your collar. It's okay, because God wants to bless you. Huh? He, let me say it again, he wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. Huh? See, the type of blessing I'm talking about is intended for us to get to know Jesus better. That we would know Jesus. Uh, the fellowship of his suffering, but also the power of his resurrection. That we would walk in fellowship with him. Oh, you got to go through a little bit of suffering, but listen, the power of his resurrection is a trip. When God begins to raise you up, for this reason, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. The prisoner, I like it. In other terms, uh, translation says the bond servant. Bond servant, brother, means that you're a free will servant. You don't pierce the ear. You're a bond servant. Huh? For I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, not for me, but for you guys, I'm a servant. Paul says, I'm a servant, not for me, for you. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. So God was given a grace, I mean, Paul was given a grace, not for him, for you. But because he was given the grace, he got blessed. Why was he blessed? Because he was a blessing to the uh, whole people. That is, verse 3, that is, the mystery known to me by revelation, as I've already written. See, we are given this administration of God's grace. What is God's grace? Wow, God's grace. God's grace means... You can deserve hell and not get it. God's grace. God's grace is, you're all messed You don't messed up before you came to church today, but for some reason God didn't kill you, you're still here, and you can repent. That's God's grace. Are you with me? Are you with me? You understand what I'm talking about? God's grace means we, we're all alive and breathing and kicking and able to receive his blessing, his favor. Why? Because it's God's grace that gives it to us. God's grace. 
He says the administration of God's grace. That word administration is a very interesting word. That word is in the original language is oikonomia, which where we get the word of economy. See, God's economy is his grace. God's economy. We work for money. We want money. Money. God does not move by money. God is moving under his economy, and his economy is grace. When we begin to operate in grace, when we begin to follow his will, when we begin to produce more grace, people with grace. What happens? We enlarge in God's economy. Because that's God's economy. When we enlarge in God's economy, God says, I got to give this person favor. Why? Because they got it. They know my grace. They're, they're reaching the souls. They're doing something for my honor and glory. Now I'm going to give them wealth. I'm going to give them emotional stability. Why? Because you're operating in his economy. Get out of your economy. If all you care about is you and your bills and you're this and you're that, then you're not in God's grace. You're in your own grace. You're in your own economy. That's not God's economy. And what's the hard, now here's the hard part. My economy, I'm, I'm using an example, the world what we live in comes into conflict with God's economy. So now, here's God's economy. Trust me, God. I, I mean, Al, I got grace. And I'm over here, but God, I know you got grace. I got bills. Are you with me? And I got this, I got that. He goes, I know you got that. Don't you think I know? I, I know you know, but do you know? He goes, yeah, I know. Just focus on my economy. Okay. Let me get back to your economy. What's your economy? Grace. Okay, well, how do you find grace? You find people that need me, that should go to hell, but you, you hop them out. Okay. You find people that don't love me, that hate me, and you convince them to love me. Get them into my, my, my world. Are you with me? Focus on that, God. I, I'll try, God, but you know, I still got this bill. I got Colorado, Colorado Springs utility after me. I got my car payment. I got this payment. He goes, don't worry about that. Get over back on my economy. Okay, Man, God, this is kind of hard, God. All right, I'm back over here. And watch. Every time I've stayed focused on this, somehow, some way, he takes care of everything over here. He does it. The problem is, it doesn't make sense. That's the problem. There's no rhyme or reason. There's, there's nothing orderly about it. There's no accountant. Like my accountant would go crazy if they see my books. Why? Because my books make no sense. Why? Because I don't live in my books. I live over here. And because I live over here, I'm in God's economy. God begins to take care of it. Boom. 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 The problem for the weak emotionally, what happens? They give in. And they said, nope, uh-uh, I'm going to take care of it. you got to do this. I'm going to I'm gonna work two jobs, three jobs, four jobs. I'm going to make my kids work. I'm going to put my kids in the field. <laughs> and they get, out of, they get into their economy, and they, and they might find a solution, but they've lost access to God's economy. And so they get trapped, and they stay here. And the thing is, they stay here, and they stay in church. They stay in church but they're in their economy, and they get more frustrated. Why? Because God will not give them spiritual insight. Why? Because they're in the wrong economy. God does, they'll bless themselves, and God will go ahead with your bad self. That's how everybody operates. Only the spiritual learn to operate in this area, in God's economy. Is it easy? Mm -mm. Is it possible? Yes. But you have to stay there. Not just in the good times, but in the bad times. Why? Because when you're there and you don't, you don't understand, this is where your sacrifice is made. God, this makes no sense. I shouldn't be doing this. You know, I got, I got to do this, God. I got to do this. And you know, God, and I should be over there. Just stay here. Focus on this. And you watch me get you through it. Faith. 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 Faith, and, you, and you'll get you through it. Hmm? That's why Luke 16, Jesus is writing, or the, the writer of Luke was writing, he says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? So you, you're, you're stuck on the world system. How in the world, if, you're, if you can't even be faithful with this world system and bring it to God's economy, 
How can God give you more? How can he give you the true riches if he can't trust you with unrighteous stuff? But most believers are stuck over here and never get spiritual blessings. Got real quiet. Luke 16, 13 says this, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Can't do it. See, in Revelations, in the Revelation of Ephesians, we can now look at Luke 16 like this. If given material blessings and emotional blessings, wealth, mammon, you do not use it properly, how can God give you true riches, spiritual blessings? It is, poss- it is impossible for the person that is money motivated to be giving true spiritual blessings. Now, how is money motivated? Just that. If your bills motivate you more than God's ministry, then you're money motivated. If anything aside from God's will grabs your attention more, then you're, you're, you're materially ble- motivated. Does anybody want to be blessed? Come on now. Does anybody want to be blessed? You have to stay in God's blessings. You got it. And here's the thing. I can only share. Because I've done it. I've seen my pastor do it. I've seen Pastor Sonny do it. I've seen Nikki do it. I can only share with you. You have to do it. It's going to be a trip. Let me tell you. It's a trip. Because there's going to be no way out. You know, like I, I said, it's going to be impossible. And all of a sudden, God's going to come through. And then you begin to see things like, wow, God really does provide. Wow. When he says he, he closed the sparrow and he takes care of that, he really does. Why? Because, man, I, I knew I was done for it. And God came through. And then when you get used to that, like, Woo, what are you going to do now, God? Come on now, bring it on. You know, you're, you're like Rick James. Give it to me, Lord. Dun, 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 right? Oh, I was too deep for you. Anyway, let me get back here. The person cannot purchase this. You have to go through it. Huh? The administration of, cannot be bought. The God economy, you, have to, you, can't, you can't buy it, you can't beg for it, you can't borrow it. The Holy Spirit gave Paul the opportunity to receive God's anointing. He paid the price for that spiritual blessing, and the price was determined by God, and God gave it to him. Everybody's got a price. Remember, I said salvation is a what? Free. But the ministry, the spiritual blessing, ah, there's something you got to go through to get to it. Look at Job. He went through hell. Now, hopefully you ain't Job, right? Change your name. Amen. Because <laughs> he lost everything. But even though he lost everything, he even told his first wife, curse, the first wife told him, curse God and die. Lord, and then he tells his wife, should I take the good and not the bad from the Lord? His friends abandoned him, began to talk to him. You must be cursed, Job. What's wrong with you? And Job was a righteous man. He did everything he was supposed to do. And he still was all got lost everything. But the Bible says that Job got more in the second half of his life than he did in his latter half. Why? Because he didn't waver. He stood true to God, to, to God and God blessed him. Why? He gave him those spiritual blessings. The price was determined by God, but you're going to have to pay it. Let's close. So how do we maximize God's blessing in our life? After you have ensured your motives are pure, get specific. I mean, begin to get specific with God. Ephesians 3.20, by his mighty power at work within us, he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever dare to ask or hope. That's a heavy, heavy statement. That's why I like this, 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 this portion of Scripture. Through His power working in us. Now, there's the qualifier. What type of power is working in you? By His power working within us, He is able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever dare ask for. I dare you. You ever see that? I dare you. Cross that line. I dare you. Oh, yeah, I'll cross the line. All right. he, that's what God is saying. Look, if you begin to lock into my economy, I dare you. 
And it, you can ask for whatever. Remember, I just asked for a continent. He dared me. I asked for it. Oh, yeah? But he just said, I will give you even more than you can even dare. I'll give you more than that. That's not just for Paul. That's for you. Ask him for something. I dare you. Oh, let me say it again. Go ahead. Are you afraid now? Afraid, chicken? Mock, 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 mock. Ask him. Ask him. I dare you. Ask him to bless you. I dare you. Ask him to make you a pastor. I dare you. Ask him to make you an evangelist that reached hundreds of thousands. I dare you. Ask him to be a teacher. I dare you. A professor. I dare you. A doctor. A lawyer. I don't care. I dare you. Because he will give you more than you can ever ask for. You want it? I dare you. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. God's disposition is to bless. We must learn to ask for it. Bless my marriage. Anybody want to bless marriage? Ask for it. I dare you. Bless my business. You want to bless business? Ask them. Bless. Bless my family? Okay. Ask them. Bless my church? All of us. Ask them. Bless it. Everything you bless the Lord, everything that you bless the Lord with that will bring Him glory, God will give it. He wants to bless. If He knows you're in His economy, He wants to give you more. You got to get into His economy. Psalm 67, 1 and 2 reads like this. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face shine upon us. That's what I want. So today, I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing. No, I'm going to ask you to come forward and we're going to pray together a prayer of blessing that I wrote down. And if you want that blessing, because I believe in God's blessing, the altars are open.